We are on Ephesians week 10. And in these last two weeks, we've been talking about how to walk. The Apostle Paul has told us to walk worthy of our calling. And he's given us several examples to contrast the type of walk that reflects Christ and the type of walk that reflects the world. And we covered those last time. This week, we're on chapter 5, verse 15. And guess what? Paul is still talking about our walk. He says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So every day, every single day, we are to be mindful of our thoughts, our words, our actions, asking ourselves, are they wise? Are they unwise? Are we bringing God glory? We can wake up asking the Lord, to help us to make the most of that day. Lord, help me to walk worthy of you today. It continues, So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So as we think about what it means to walk worthy, we see in verses 17 and 18, two ends of the spectrum. On one end, there's do not be foolish, do not get drunk with wine. Those do not reflect a worthy walk. On the opposite end, we see understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within when we believe. We've talked about that. So obviously we can have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, but not be filled with the Spirit. We know this also from chapter 3, which we covered, where Paul prays for believers to be filled with all the fullness of God. So Paul is saying, be filled with the Spirit. And his use of that verb means be continuously filled with the Spirit. It's not a one-time thing where we can say, hey, I'm filled with the Spirit and I'm going to ride this out for the rest of my life. No, it's a continual filling of the Spirit. So how do we get there and remain there continuously? Well, notice again what was on the same end of the spectrum as be filled with the Spirit. It was understand what the will of the Lord is. And we know that the Lord's will is contained in his word. So there's a connection with the word of God. Turn with me now to Colossians. Look how similar this passage is in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. How do you let the word dwell richly within you? You're in it all the time in one way or another. You're reading it, studying it, meditating on it maybe memorizing it. And the word just goes to work inside of you throughout the day as situations arise. It's in your thoughts. It's on your tongue. It's convicting you, strengthening you, encouraging you. It's part of your daily walk. When the word is dwelling richly within you, when you're allowing it to impact every area of your life, when you're prayerfully walking in obedience to the word, you've put yourself under the control of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading and guiding you in every part of your life. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, to give your life over to being led by the Spirit. And we can see both from Ephesians and Colossians is that the result is that you're joyful. You'll have psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs on your heart. And you're thankful. The Ephesians verse says, 
always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Colossians verse says, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So that is a result of being filled with the spirit, being filled with the word. Your heart is overwhelmed with gratitude. It's not based on what's happening in your life. You just have a thankful heart for who God is and what he's done for you in Christ. And look what else comes from being filled with the spirit. Verse 21 in Ephesians 5 says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Another translation puts it submitting to one another in the fear of God. So yes, we're about to talk about submission. How many of you think that's a bad word? And how many of you think submission is just for wives? As this verse 21 says, we submit to one another. We kind of talked about this in chapter four when we talked about humility and regarding one another as more important than ourselves. That's how we preserve unity in the body. If we all insisted on our own way or our own rights, we could never walk as one. We are subject to one another. We consider one another. We even regard one another as more important than ourselves. But we also know that submission is for all because as believers, first and foremost, we all submit to God. James 4, 7, submit therefore to God. That word submission comes from a military term that means to arrange or rank under. There has to be order. We come up under God's leadership and authority. And as the supreme commander, as the most high God, he puts others in positions of authority in our lives. And in the home, he's placed husbands as head. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So first he says, we're all subject to one another. And then he speaks directly to wives and says, wives be subject to come up under the leadership of your husband as unto the Lord. It doesn't say submit only if we feel our husbands are making the right choices or decisions. It doesn't even say only if your husband is a believer. Certainly we don't have to submit to what would go against the word of God, to what would be sin. If our husband says rob a bank, no, we don't submit to that. But generally we are to submit. Even if we don't agree, or think it's wise. First Peter 3, 1 and 2 says, In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. So we're not only called to submit, but there's a way to submit with respect, with honor to our husbands. This is contrary to the ways of the world, but Paul has already told us not to walk as the world walks. We're called to walk worthy in Christ. This is God's will for marriage. God has a holy calling in marriage. It's a picture of Christ and his church. That's why it says in verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands. When we submit to our husbands, it's a picture of the way the church is to submit to Christ. When we submit, even in disagreement, we are obeying the Lord. We are glorifying the Lord and this holy picture 
that he has designed. Am I saying it's easy? I've been married for 21 years and I have a fairly strong personality. No, I'm not saying it's easy. It wasn't easy for me to learn to walk in submission to my husband. And there are still times when I see how much growing I need to do in this area. But even though I don't always get it right, I have learned that God's way is the best way. So how do we grow in this walk of submission? Pray, pray, pray. We have to pray for our husbands always. Pray that he seeks the Lord. Pray that he studies the word. Pray that he has the wisdom to make the right decisions regarding the family, the job, ministry, everything. If you're praying, you're actively putting your trust in the Lord, which makes it easier to submit. If your husband is not a believer, I know that's not easy, but nothing is too hard for God. Pray that he knows Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And as you shine your light in that home, as you walk worthy in your home, you are a living witness to your husband. And we can pray for grace to submit. Lord, you know I do not agree with this decision. It is not sitting well with me. But I know you have called me to submit and I just pray that you would give me the grace in this situation to submit. I pray that you would redirect my husband if that's what needs to be done. I'm putting my trust in you. The Lord is well able to turn our husband's heart if that's what needs to be done. And his work is actually much more effective if we are submitting rather than causing strife. We can pray for humility, which is what we're called to, and it begins in the home. Sometimes we think we're right. We think we know what ought to be done, but God can do a work in our hearts and show us where we're off course. But if we think we have a huge obligation as wives, look what the Lord calls the husbands to. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. The husband's obligations are aligned with Jesus. That's who he's called to measure up to in the marriage. He's called to love his wife as Christ loves the church. We might look at what our husbands are called to do and think, my husband doesn't love me to that depth. He doesn't love me the way Christ loves his church. But that should be part of our prayers for our husband. We can see the high calling that God expects of our husbands. And they'll be called to account for that. So we should support our husbands with our prayers that they would love us as God intends. And this last verse in chapter 5. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Respect. So important in marriage. We should ask the Lord to show us if we're respecting our husbands. Are we respecting them in our tone of voice, in our facial expressions, in the attention that we pay him or don't pay him? There are so many ways that we can show respect or not show respect. So we submit to one another in the body. Wives submit to husbands. And then we see in chapter six, 
children submit to parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That's pretty straightforward. We're probably all familiar with those verses and it's no surprise to us that yes, children ought to submit to their parents. But it's interesting that parents are also called to walk worthy with respect to how we treat our children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. And parents have this important calling, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In our own walk, we're to be growing in the faith, renewing our mind with the word. And if we have children, they should be getting the first fruits of what we're learning. When they're young, that can start with reading them Bible stories, singing praise songs, but also by our actions, we're showing them how to walk in love, how to treat other people. They can see if we're walking in humility or in forgiveness. They can see if our lives match what we say we believe. We want to model for them what it means to walk worthy while also affirmatively teaching them truth from the word. I love Deuteronomy 6. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Bringing our children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord should simply be a way of life. So we have guidance with respect to the relationship between the husband and the wife, parents and children, and then we come to this one. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Many of us are aware that this passage was used in support of racial slavery in the United States. This passage does not condone slavery as it existed in America, that was sin. I just had to state that. In ancient times, slavery was often used as a form of indentured servanthood, where you might serve for a definite period of time to pay off a debt, perhaps. There was also slavery when one group conquered another, such as when Babylon conquered Israel and they were all carted off to Babylon as slaves, like Daniel. For us today, these verses are often used in the context of an employer-employee relationship. And so I'm going to talk about them from that standpoint. And in such a situation, it's saying, if you are an employee, be an exemplary employee. Conduct your work as if Jesus were your employer. You're working as unto the Lord. That's who you're aiming to please in attitude and behavior. You're doing the will of God from the heart, which is what we're all called to do in all things. And I have to read this part again because this is such an awesome promise. It says, with good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord. Even if people don't see or don't acknowledge what we do. Even if they don't reward us, the Lord sees. The Lord will reward. Our blessings come from Him. And this is how we know these verses weren't properly applied to justify slavery in America because they certainly weren't following verse 9, which says, And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening 
knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Whether you're the husband or the wife, the parent or the child, the employer or the employee, we all have an obligation before the Lord. We're all called to walk worthy before the Lord and treat others in a way that brings God glory. Here's the beautiful thing. We don't have to fear submission. We don't have to worry about how hard it may be to submit in our own homes. If our focus is on Jesus, if we're living a life that is controlled by the Holy Spirit and led by the Holy Spirit, we'll be submitted to God and the rest will take care of itself. I pray the word of God dwells richly within each of us.